So welcome everyone. Thanks, um, thanks very much for dialing in and joining us this evening. I'm excited uh, given the, the unusual circumstances that we, we find ourselves in to be streaming through to you on behalf of the, the AWA Vic branch. Um, what we hope is engaging, enlightening and inspiring content. Uh, and, and content completely in un, in un, in uh, geez, uninterrupted. Try and get my tongue around that word. Uninterrupted by speech impediments, technical difficulties, and small children. Uh, and uh, hopefully, in our small way, uh, doing our bit to keep you connected with your water industry colleagues, and uh, maybe just keep you a little bit sane during lockdown. Okay, my name's Tim Anderson and I'm on the AWA Vic Branch Committee. Uh, I've got a five-year-old son who's been bribed to stay quiet tonight, so hopefully that works. I'm also a civil engineer and my day job is managing a, a group of very talented water professionals in GHD's Victorian Water Infrastructure Group. And uh, GHD are conveniently our, our sponsor for this evening, so thank you. Before getting too far along, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm hosting this webinar on the lands of the Wurundjeri people, and I wish to acknowledge them as the traditional owners of my local area. I'd also like to extend that acknowledgement to the traditional owners of the land on which you're all joining us from. I'd also like to pay my respects to Wurundjeri elders, past and present, and Aboriginal elders from other communities who may have joined us this evening. We've got three fantastic speakers presenting tonight on water sensitive cities and their role in creating resilience. Many of us on this webinar live in Melbourne, which is recognised as one of the world's most livable cities. But climate change, population growth and urbanisation are challenges that threaten to disrupt this high standard of living. I think the movement behind water sensitive cities is a recognition that despite having a world-class uh, water and wastewater system, we can do better to reduce our impact on the, the natural em environment. The CRC for water sensitive cities states that the vision of a water sensitive city has emerged as an aspirational concept where water is managed in a way that meets a city's water needs, while also supporting a city's urban livability, sustainability, productivity and resilience. So whether that be impacts on livability like dry sports fields during the drought or rubbish floating in the borders of your favourite urban waterway or potentially more significant issues like flooding, over extraction and overuse of resources, the water sensitive cities vision offers a toolkit to, to help us address some of these challenges. And our speakers tonight are going to present some views and some examples of this. Now, following our speakers, we've got a Q&A panel session where our three speakers will be joined by Andrew Chapman, formerly of South East Water and very familiar, someone who's very familiar with the Fisherman's Bend project uh, and now Director Infrastructure at, uh, at uh, Infrastructure Advisory at Oricon. As we go along, you can enter questions for the panel discussion into the webinar Q&A function. And you can also rank those questions that are asked by others. And that way we can try and work through as many questions as possible uh, and with a nod to the preferences of the audience. And if we run out of time, we'll, uh, we'll we may be able to answer some of them outside the webinar. So feel free to start thinking about questions now and, and add those into the, the Q&A. Okay, so let me now introduce our first speaker, Paul Satur. Paul is an environmental and social science researcher with the Monash Sustainable Development Institute and a very recent recipient of AWA's Australian Young Water Professional of the Year. Well, congratulations, Paul, on that award and welcome. Yeah, thanks, Tim, and hi, everyone. Um, welcome. Uh, great to be coming together uh, tonight and, and you know exploring um, you know this topic which is something that 
I'm certainly quite passionate about and, and um, you know, look forward to hearing from all of you out there. Uh, I'd, of course, like to begin by extending um, Tim's acknowledgement of the traditional owners in the lands in which we meet and pay our respects to elders past, present, emerging, and of course, acknowledge any traditional owners who are joining us here today. Um, and I'd further like to take the opportunity to acknowledge uh, the role of uh, Indigenous knowledge, traditional owner knowledge, which um, for thousands of years has recognised the importance of the uh, deep connections between people and place and culture. Um, and I think that uh, understanding is, is really something that sits at the heart of uh, the, the today's discussion and, and something that, um, you know, in the planning and management of our cities that we're really only now beginning to grasp. Um, so as the first cab off the rank tonight, I thought it might be useful to provide you with a bit of a scene setter um, into that connection and, and what that means in terms of this idea of resilience and a water sensitive city. Um, and of course, I'd like to start perhaps by sharing with you a bit of a story about uh, an experience I had recently last year. So this photo um, is one that uh, I took uh, in a place called Chikapundum, which is in West Java in Indonesia. And I've been spending some time over there over the last uh, couple of years developing a, a research project, working with uh, informal settlements. Now, now, this is an example of one of those informal settlements. It's based um, within the tributary of the Chittorum River, one of the world's most polluted waterways. And uh, Tim, if you jump to the next slide. So each year, um, the communities such as this that live in these really dense urban environments um, experience pretty extreme flooding events. And now this waterway is, is pretty heavily polluted. There's something like 340,000 tonnes of waste water that goes down at a day. And you'll see that line on the side of that building. That's a bit of an indication as to where flood uh, waters rise. Um, so, of course, there's a critical question is, you know, how does a community exist when, you know, in, in a space where flood water is rising, um, you know, to such a level and having such a dramatic impact in threatening the health and livelihood of, uh, of communities there? And the answer um, very much uh, is related to how we might think about um, this uh, issue. Am I... Um, I'm getting a I'm getting a call. Is that Digna? Am I? Uh, can you still hear me, Tim? Yeah, you're coming through loud and clear, Paul. Oh, okay. Sorry, everyone. Um, I was just worried that maybe my bandwidth has bombed out. So um, to go back to what I was saying, the the answer is that there is a community that is incredibly connected, um, both up and downstream of this river. They are well networked. They have a really high literacy as to the hydrodynamics of that river and really strong uh, what we might call a water literacy, knowledge and understandings, practices and behaviours that enable them to respond in contexts like that. Um, just want to jump to the next one, Tim. So, you know, what we see in this example is uh, an instance where our um, infrastructure, um, you know, and the reliance on it is pretty limited. It's not a viable infrastructure to, to build resilience. So instead, there's a very rich social dynamic and a social process and a culture for that amongst the community um, to support the, their resilience. Now, I often, uh, you know, like to sit back and sort of reflect in these sorts of moments and think, a little bit for a moment as to um, the sorts of responses um, and the sorts of experiences that, um, you know, the communities of our, you know, more developed urban cities like here in Australia, um, you know, have in terms of, you know, in times of extreme weather, which looks a little bit like this next slide at times. How did you go, Tim? Have you, there we go. So, um, you know, often we don't have to wait too long after an extreme weather event um, to see, you know, an image and a headline like something like this. And um, I think the other really in interesting thing to think about, jump to the next one, Tim, um, is that, you know, across Australia, um, our, you know, knowledge and understanding of our urban water cycle, um, you know, the, the literacies of our communities are actually quite low. 
Um, this was some research that was done by um, Kelly Fielding and, and Angela Deans from the University of Queensland looking at community water literacies. And you can see those from percentages. Most people don't necessarily have what we call a higher water literacy. So a very different experience to somewhere like, for example, uh, you know, Chikapundung, where there are communities that are very actively engaged in the planning and management of, um, you know, how they, how they um, you know, respond to extreme weather events. Now, this, of course, is not to suggest a complacency amongst the Australian community. If you jump to the next one, Tim. Instead, um, what it is more uh, a symptom of is um, a history of a culture for resilience that's predicated around a reliance on infrastructure, a very infrastructure-centric approach. So much so that when that infrastructure fails, things can go wrong pretty quickly. Now, in the past, if you jump to the next one for me, Tim, uh, in the past, that has not necessarily um, been a huge issue. But of course, now with increasing uh, frequency and severity of climate related impacts, we're beginning to recognise that the uh, reliance on infrastructure alone is not going to provide a necessary resilience to support our communities. And of course, we're seeing this um, significantly through um, major economic impacts and major social impacts um, resulting from extreme weather events. So uh, the call or the, or the momentum now has shifted uh, away from this reliance on infrastructure to what we call a socio-technical response. If you jump to the next one for me, Tim. Um, it's this idea that ensuring a city's resilience is about achieving socio-technical outcomes. This idea that our infrastructure can be hybridised and multifunctional, but in order for it to do so, it needs to be underpinned by a social system that enables the communities and stakeholders within that com community to be building and supporting uh, the sorts of knowledge and understanding and water and behaviours that we need. So jump to the next one for me, Tim. So this idea of a social, in, you know, in, or a socio-technical endeavour is really, uh, you know, what you know sits at the heart of the essence of this idea of a water-sensitive city. It's about the fact that uh, multifunctional design um, and infrastructure and the planning of that can uh, build and foster resilience, provided there is a community alongside it that has the necessary literacies. Um, to be able to engage in that process and ensure that these response options are, are contextually suitable. So what this might mean is on a day, a sunny day, we see urban green spaces and green walls and green spines providing amenity and urban cooling initiatives and enriching livability. But of course, if you jump to the next slide for me, Tim, um, you know, in instances where uh, we start to see rain and, and storm events, um, these infrastructures double back and provide this other role in terms of stormwater conveyance or, um, you, know, uh, what, you know, flood water retention, thereby supporting the resilience of cities. Now, of course, in order for us to do that, what we need to be achieving is this balance between the infrastructure and environmental outcomes and the socio-cultural dynamics of communities for them to have the necessary understandings and capacities um, to understand the value that that infrastructure plays. And of course, where appropriate, be engaged in the actual planning and management of that infrastructure. Uh, next slide. So, of course, we're not there yet. There's still significantly some work to be done. We haven't uh, yet seen an example of a water sensitive city um, around the world. Um, and of course, here in Australia, as our infrastructure and our technology and our processes for achieving that are transitioning to this pro place of, you know, this water sensitive seas context, we in turn need to be thinking about how we're transitioning our communities at the same time. And that involves unsettling these pre-existing urban paradigms of this infrastructure alliance and start to be fostering the sorts of literacies and behaviours um, that uh, are required in order of us to see and realise this water sensitive vision. Jump to the next one, Tim. So this is really what this idea or concept of a social resilience is about. It's about the way that institutions, community, and you know, are, are networked and work together 
to access resources, learn from experiences and develop ways of dealing collectively with problems in their local environments. And where social resilience becomes really interesting, I think, is that instead of things like livability and sustainability, where we're often looking at the needs, you know, achieving, meeting current needs versus meeting needs of the future, for example, social resilience and resilience in general is really a question of capacities. It's about what enhances the capacities of individuals and groups and organisations to deal with these threats and respond. And this, of course, is a question of a system. It's about the way that infrastructure, systems, governance processes and the necessary economic and social resources come together in a local environment to support those capacities. Uh, just jump to the next one for me, please. Now, of course, experiences recently of drought, of extensive flood, of bushfire, and even things like pandemics have taught us that um, building these capacities is not simply a matter of addressing them when the, you know, when, the, um, when the time comes. It's not purely about focusing on the way communities respond to events. Instead, there is what we call kind of three pillars to this idea around building social resilience. There's the coping capacities, so that ability for stakeholders to be able to draw on the resources they need to respond at the time of events. Then, of course, there's the adaptive capacity, so that ability of stakeholders to learn from experiences and to adjust and, and respond to do better next time. And then finally, the broader transformative capacities. So that idea of the participatory process in this broader system and ensuring that all stakeholders have a seat at that table and are engaged in the decision making and planning process to support the overall resilience of the system. Um, so, Tim, might jump to the next one. I'm mindful that I'm racing the clock here, so we might um, skip ahead a little bit. Maybe just go two, two or three slides, wait till we fill up these boxes. So, I was going to provide you with um, some broader experiences from the, uh, some research I've done looking at social inequality in Australian cities and the impacts um, or relationship that had to people's water use. And there was some really interesting um, uh, discussion that came out around the experiences of the millennial drought. And if you take a, time, a moment to look at some of these experiences, what you will notice is that in different communities that vary in different sort of financial and material and social resources, the capacities um, to cope in the context of drought, to adapt to it, and then of course to be engaged in transformative processes are really different. Um, you know, you can see Lewis in Broadmeadows, for example, um, you know, having this awareness of things like rainwater tanks to enable them to cope to the drought experience, but not really being able to afford it and not really being able to engage in it. Um, Sarah similarly was having, uh, you know, considerable difficulty in terms of um, being able to, you know, adapt to extreme heat. So her adaptive capacity was really diminished. Where you can see this statement on your left from the water sector provider who recognises that, you know, communities that are really actively engaged in um, resilience planning and water sensitive cities planning are often really well connected, have, you know, really good financial resources and really rich technical literacies that other communities might not necessarily have. Uh, so jump to the next slide, please, Tim. What this essentially boils down to is the fact that context matters if we are to effectively begin developing water sensitive cities and building the sorts of um, social resilience and social connectivity required to support them, these approaches need to happen at a local scale with local people that deliver locally and contextually appropriate outcomes. Um, and that's really what this circular map is about. It's about understanding the cultural and environmental interactions of your community in place and the way that things like technologies and infrastructure um, play into their daily experiences, how the sorts of processes for engaging them in uh, effect can be effectively developed to support the sorts of literacies and understanding they possess. And then of course, what are the sorts of economic and social and cultural resources they have that shape the sorts of daily needs they have, shape their lived experience and of course shape their capacities. So I did want to leave it there and I think one last slide, Tim. We've been doing some work recently uh, in the city of Melbourne, looking at this idea of social resilience to flooding. This is uh, some work I've done with Jamie Hewitt and a great master's student from the CRC for Water Sensitive Cities. Um, and it has been in relation to the recent um, 
uh, re revision of Melbourne Water's flood strategy. We've been looking at some of the um, academic components around this idea of social resilience and what some of the key attributes might be. And I just wanted to um, highlight this for you because it will be coming out in a couple of months and provides a bit of further thinking into some of the key um, things that help build social resilience to flooding. Um, in communities and some of these stem across not just flooding but can be things like bushfire resilience, things like um, urban heat and drought resilience for example. Um, so what we see is things like behaviours um, and localised action, community networks and mobilisation coming together, the requirement for good insurance and economic environments to support risk and then finally uh, bringing it all together, a uh, resilient design and flood infrastructure that fosters that sort of culture for social and community resilience. So thanks very much and really looking forward to hearing from Liam and Jetta um, on some of the wonderful examples they have of how communities have come together in this process over recent years and look forward to a discussion to follow. Fantastic. Thanks very much though, Paul. Being on time as well. Well done. Right. Okay, I'd now like to introduce Jetta Bremen, who has very kindly stepped in at late notice to, to cover for, for Pam Kerry, our uh, original speaker. Jetta is an integrated water management engineer within the Livable and Sustainable Futures team at Southeast Water. She's passionate about achieving sustainable water solutions through collaboration and her current role includes delivering and implementing the integrated water management strategy for Fisherman's Bend, which supports a large scale urban renewal in Melbourne. Uh, and that's what Jetta is going to present to us now. Thanks Jetta. Thanks Tim. Um, first, I'm just making sure you can hear me okay. Can do. Cool. Um, Thanks, Paul. Uh, that was a fantastic presentation. I can definitely see how some of those learnings will become very useful for, for Fisherman's Band going forward with the implementation of the water sensitive city strategy there. Um, before I begin, um, I'd firstly also like to acknowledge uh, the traditional owner of the country that I'm speaking to you all from tonight, uh, the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. Uh, and I pay my respects to their elders, uh, past, present and emerging. So tonight, um, I'm looking forward to uh, taking you through very quickly um, the journey that is uh, Fisherman's Bend. Uh, I'm not sure of people's background knowledge on this, so I am gonna go into a bit of the background about the framework plan, uh, the development of, of the two strategies I've been involved with, and I'd like to spend some time going through some of the learnings that I've made uh, along the way. Uh, next slide, Tim. So, Fisherman's Bend, as you can see, uh, uh, is right next to Melbourne CBD. It's bordered by uh, the Yarra River and it's big. It's one of the biggest renewal projects in Australia and I think potentially the Southern Hemisphere at about 480 hectares. Uh, next slide, Tim. Um, by 2050, we're expecting there to be a population of 80,000 residents um, and there will also be 80,000 people working there as well. Um, and in terms of um, what's driving renewal within Fisherman's Bend, uh, there is a framework plan that has been developed by the state government for Fisherman's Bend with input from both the private and public sector. And that's really what's um, driving what we're going to be seeing and how it's going to be delivered to um, cover all facets of urban planning around transport, energy, water and innovation to ensure that we're driving the right levels of social and economic and environmental outcomes. Uh, and the sustainability and livability bar has been set really high for Fisherman's Bend, um, which is um, really great to see. And at Southeast Water and other stakeholders involved in the development of the water sensitive city strategy, we really see water as being pivotal to the design and enabling this livability. Um, next slide, Tim. So in terms of that framework plan, um, that really set the scene, and I'm going back a few years now around how um, Southeast Water went about starting to explore how we might provide um, 
Sorry, I'm just noticing that some of the, the slide hasn't come through. So apologies for that. I'll, I'll explain it as I go. Um, but yeah, the, the framework plan really provided, oh, go back a slide, Tim. Um, provided us um, with the, um, set the scene for what we needed to be pr providing as a service in terms of both water and sewage for, for fishermen spend. And the two more relevant um, sustainability, sustainability goals within that framework plan were around providing a climate resilient um, community in terms of delivering um, for resilience against um, climate shocks such as drought and flooding, and also a water sensitive city strategy. So there were targets within um, the framework strategy around reducing um, potable water by around 45%, reducing wastewater discharge by 50%. Um, providing a drought proof supply to support a green and cool landscape and, and making a more resilient community when it comes to reducing um, flooding um, both within the within that like our road and landscape areas of fishermen spend but i think what really set southeast water and also the other stakeholders involved in the two strategies in good, good stead is really understanding how what we're delivering as a service really ties into some of those other sustainability goals um, to deliver resilience as a whole to fishermen spend. So the importance that water plays, um, for example, in um, provide a connected and livable community um, helped us deliver the right, is helping us deliver the right outcomes and also helped us deliver a, a business case that was sound and, and given a whole of community kind of perspective. Um, next slide, Tim. Um, so what that kind of played out into for um, Southeast Water in terms of um, providing water and sewage services for Fisherman's Bend was the use of two alternative non-potable um, water supplies that were really contributing to two different outcomes at Fisherman's Bend. So the first being um, rainwater tanks at the lot scale, which are a requirement as part of the planning scheme now in Fisherman's Bend. And their first port of call there is really to to um, contribute towards flood mitigation, mainly with that nuisance flooding. So stopping water from buildings even entering um, water, it, stopping water from buildings entering the, the public um, stormwater network in, in the first place um, and reducing the nutrient load going into the Yarra River by reusing that water. Um, Southeast Water will also be delivering a 18.5 meg per day water re recycling plant by 2030. And that's really there to provide that backup supply and ensure we meet those potable substitution targets and also um, help to provide a um, drought resilient um, non-potable water supply to ensure that green space stays green even in times of grout, drought. We're also exploring how we could ensure that that water recycling plant, which is gonna be within the employment precinct of Fisherman's Bend, can um, fit within the urban form of the community. So how can we provide that as a multifaceted kind of infrastructure and make sure it's value adding to different elements of what's needed within that employment precinct. So that's really an ongoing conversation as part of the implementation of the, water, uh, the integrated water management solution. But I guess what we're seeing here isn't a water sensitive city strategy yet. Um, so if you go to the next slide, Tim. So that really came along um, in the next stage of the project that I was involved with, which was an even more collaborative process of the development of the drainage and flood mitigation strategy. So that project was led by Melbourne Water, um, but they did a fantastic job of ensuring that it was really a Cross, cross collaboration with Southeast Water, the two councils and the Fisherman's Bend Task Force that now sits in the jobs precincts and region. Um, and we wouldn't have had the outcome in terms of the development of that strategy without that level of collaboration. Um, and a lot of infrastructure, the solution is um, obviously in need of infrastructure to ensure we're meeting those alternative um, water targets and also mitigating flooding by providing flood and Woolsewood infrastructure across the different realms of our urban form. Um, but especially as we work towards implementation of this strategy, um, social resilience, ensuring that people are seeing water in the landscape, understands how water sits within their, their environment is gonna become really important. How do we fit within the urban form? How do we 
um, ensure that we can provide a service through Woolsit infrastructure for flood mitigation, but also make that a usable park or a usable, usable landscape. Make sure our public um, paths are connected to our buildings like that. All these elements are going to be, become really important as we continue to um, now that we've moved on from developing the strategy, implementing it within Fisherman's Bend. Um, next slide. Next, Tim. So I guess I've condensed a fair few years of work from a number of stakeholders and a number of people into a few minutes. And I just thought I'd go over some of the learnings that have come from this. And the first one is really the importance of, of shared goals and that framework plan and the sustainability goals and the targets that sit within it, set the overarching why for all stakeholders, the goals were common and everyone had buy-in through the, the engagement that the government had when they were developing that framework. And that's been really important, not just during the development of the strategy, but the ongoing implementation and the ongoing conversations that we're gonna be having but to have that overarching why to constantly come back to. And I think for me, the other benefit it provided was it allows you, or it allowed me to, to consistently check in on myself. And when I'm say having a conversation with um, the wider working group around, well, what's the best um, outcome um, for a particular part of the strategy, my thought process and my preference for a certain outcome, is that being led by trying to meet the best for fishermen's bend and the outcomes that we want to see? Or are there other risks or organisational drivers that are influencing my thought process? And neither of those elements are wrong and we need to be thinking about all of them. But I think it's really important to be reflecting and checking in what the primary driver is for those conversations that we're, ha that we're having. Um, the second one, um, which I think is obvious to you all and that I've touched on is that collaboration is key. Um, we, um, as I think six stakeholders, there was a, um, we had a working group and also a steering group who met very regularly um, through, through meetings and also emails. Um, and this was a really integral part in achieving a really good outcome and also ensuring we were given different perspectives and different opinions when we were having conversations. Um, I think the governance structure that we had as part of that collaboration was important, but also the relationships that we had amongst each other and just being able to have honest conversations and, and go through um, our, our differences of opinions to get the best solution. So relationships is really key when it comes to collaboration. Um, for me, uh, I learned through um, Fisherman Spend a lot about the planning scheme. Um, and sometimes I wish I could remain ignorant <laughs> about elements of, of, of the planning scheme um, because it's, it's just, it's a minefield and it's so important, but it's so challenging, I guess, to be working in. So to me, I think um, never end up underestimate the power of the planning scheme and how it can help you deliver a water sensitive city strategy. And also think about, well, how is this water sensitive city strategy gonna be applied through the planning process, through building and design, through construction, through operation. You need to be thinking about all those elements when you're delivering and developing your strategy. Um, you, can't, you can't just think about it when you get to it. It has to be all encompassing. Engage with the people who are implementing the strategy. Um, engage with the people um, who have the concerns um, and get them to help you solve the problems. Um, developing the strategy is the easy part sometimes. And in this world of water sensitive city strategy and integrated water management, we are disruptive, not only to our industry, but also to developers and plumbers and the hydraulic consultants. So if you're not engaging them and getting them involved in developing the solutions, it's unlikely you're gonna get a long-term outcome that's going to work, work for you and your project. Um, take wind throughout the process. To me, um, I'm going to make the comparison with an Olympian. Um, if, Olymp if an Olympian was only focused on winning the gold medal through their four years of lead up to an Olympic Games, they'd probably just curl up in a ball and hide by the time they got to the Olympics and they'd be done. And I think the same kind of analogy applies when you're in this world. It's a really long term process. If we think about it, um, 
Fisherman's Bend was announced in, in 2012. So that's, that's eight years um, that these kinds of projects are going on and you have to take um, the wind through the process and take those nuggets and, and really, um, yeah, get, stay motivated by acknowledging and reflecting on what you're learning and what you're achieving along the way and not just on the final outcome. Um, and finally, look, reality bites. Um, there are boundaries around what we can and can't achieve and we're not going to get our ideal outcome. And sometimes I think we need to be okay with that and reflect that whatever we, whatever we learn, we're going to take that to the next project um, and eventually see, achieve that water sensitive cities um, vision that, that we're all looking to get to. So yeah, thank you for your time um, and really happy to take any questions that you have. Fantastic. Thanks very much for that, Jetta. That was great. I think we're really lucky in Melbourne. Um, challenges of the planning scheme aside to have such a large urban renewal project um, to see some of these examples of, of water sensitive cities implemented. Okay, our last speaker is Liam Sibley. Uh, Liam's a senior water strategy officer at the city of Bendigo. And Liam has a background in environmental engineering integrated water management, uh, facilitation, engagement, policy, and planning. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to hearing what Liam's got to say about uh, some of the water sensitive city initiatives in the Bendigo area. Thanks, Liam. You're on mute, Liam. That old chestnut, solid <laughs> it's start. Gonna happen. It's gonna happen to someone. <laughs> Yeah, thanks for that. Um, for some reason, my slides have come through a bit weird, so hopefully it doesn't diminish the quality of the presentation, but I'll try and use my voice to make up for it. Um, yeah, thanks everyone. Thanks Paul and Jetta. They were great starts. Really, really um, fantastic presentations. Um, I first up want to acknowledge that I'm meeting on the land of the Jar Jar Run. Um, and I acknowledge elders past, present and future. Uh, and I suppose I'm really fortunate that I'm on a journey with them for both reconciliation, but also healing country and people. Um, we're spending a lot of time at the moment uh, to build mirup, which is the word for spirit in both water, land and people. And um, yeah, it's really, really beautiful process to work through at the moment. And uh, I acknowledge all the land that you're meeting on today and all your ancestral journeys too. Um, so who am I? I suppose I'm a water strategy person. That's what I do during the day. But in my spare time, I'm a, a father, gardener and a water lover. And I suppose that sort of grounds me in who I am. Um, and I suppose I wanted my talk today just to talk a little bit about the structural, cultural and personal um, elements to building a resilient city. Because um, there, are, there are many dimensions to this. Now, um, this, Bendigo was quite fortunate that we had all the good work of the CRC to develop a um, strategy, a vision and transition strategy, which basically set out a long-term goal to create a water-sensitive city. Um, and they handed over the reins and said, yep, go work it out now. So it's been, and that's when they employed me. So I've had a really exciting journey so far, been there for nearly two years in just trying to mobilize, uh, I suppose, a system to get some change. Um, so that's where we're at. So I suppose just to keep in context about Bendigo as well is, you know, we're a dry inland city, you know, we're not growing at the same rate of Melbourne, but we're still trying to double our population in the next 20, 30 years. And but we'll have a third less rainfall in that sort of period as well is what's projected. So some interesting water challenges to work through in and amongst that. So tonight's discussion is a lot about, you know, building resilience. And I've just included a bit of a, a definition here that I got from the Resilient City Org. You know, and it, I think, you know, Paul made the comment about, you know, it's about building capacities to, and it, you know, largely it's about, you know, shocks, shocks and stresses um, to your social and economic and technical and infrastructure systems. And essentially trying to keep the same functions. Um, so that's roughly what a, a resilient city may look like. And before I go too far, I wanted to ask a question to the group. So I'm just going to take pause and we're going to pick up a poll. Um, so from your perspective, 
which is the most important factor to build resilience? Structural, cultural, or personal? And structural things are things like institutions, laws, po policies, um, regulations, as well as you know your hierarchies and organisations and power structures, resources, dollars, people, yada yada yada. So all those sort of big chunky things that sort of really dictate the system. Um, then cultural things, uh, you know, your social norms and your values, so things you believe in, things that you know you hold true between groups of people. Um, but also your collective attitudes and beliefs, you know, and that and that um, that's context dependent, but it's you know what what you believe in, um, and also your sort of spirits. And then lastly, personal, and I suppose that comes back to you know your own leadership capacity, your passion, ambitions, and skills and knowledge. And I just wanted to yeah throw it over to the audience, and if you quickly fill out uh, this poll, I'm um, just to get just to get a little bit of a sense of where you think out of them. I'm not sure. Never done a poll, so do let me know if it's coming through or not. If it would be interesting. All right. So, cultural 60%, instructional 24, and yeah, leadership 11. And I suppose there's no right answers. Like they all, you know, mix in. But it's good to to see the culture did feature so strongly, um, because yeah, it's a bit of a feature of my talk. So we're on the same page. All right. Next slide, please. So I, I want to start off with a notion that resilience is not always a good thing. Um, you know, it's, I think sometimes it's very much touted, you know, that it's, it's the be end and end all. But sometimes it can be a, quite a bad thing. And I'll give the example of either a, a dictator re regime or a colony of cockroaches. You can throw a lot of things at them and they still keep standing. Um, and sometimes the structures, cultures, and personalities keep a system locked up and stifle innovation. So I suppose I just wanted to highlight that because it's important to recognise that sometimes we need to break a system to actually achieve the resilience we want. Um, and, and often, you know, in the literature and other where they talk about serious shocks and, and the like, um, which you know it works. Um, but you know, there's also alternative ways, and I'm going to, I suppose, focus on you know, learning how to navigate structures, cultivating a culture and building personal resilience through leadership. Um, so structural resilience, you know, structures are innately resilient. That's why they build them in the first place. You know, your, your institutions and your laws, they make them so that you're very hard to tear down. Um, so, you know, you, you, could, you could look at the example of the US at the moment. You know, they've had COVID's absolutely smashing with a death toll, as well as you also having Black, Black Lives Matters um, protests. And then you've got a, a bit of a lunatic in charge. You know, it's, it's a complete basket case, but yet the system still keeps going. So structures are innately resilient. So, you know, you've got to find ways to sort of navigate them because to change them is so time consuming, politically taxing, expensive, sometimes even violent as well. So, you know, it, all in all, I, you know, I sort of think, you know, to change structures, sometimes I think, why bother unless you've got some really serious resources behind you? So I put it, I suppose I wanted to say, well, there are ways of navigating it and there are ways to drive change. And I suppose I wanted to reflect on what Bendy goes up to. Um, after the CRC for Water Sensitive Cities developed it, oh, can we go one back, please? Thank you. Um, yeah, we, there was, we had this um, beautiful strategy that set us a long-term vision, but we didn't really know what to do. So we got all the main players together, which consisted of five key partner organisations. So your water authority, your local council, state government, um, catchment management authority, and the judge run, the traditional owners, and plus a few extra organisations to sign an MOU, which is essentially a document saying, yeah, we commit to this, we'll work through it, and we'll assign some resources. Uh, from that, we developed a bit of a structure. 
um, which is, you know, I suppose just a way to do one decision making across agencies, um, but also two to have a working group to, you know, keep, keep the wheels moving. Um, because there is a lot of work in these, any of these sorts of initiatives, a huge amount. You could have, have an army really to drive them. Uh, and then I suppose lastly, having a plan. You know, I, you know, I think it's you know good to have long-term strategies such as we did from the vision and transition strategy, but you need to have ways to operationalize it. And I suppose in Bendigo, we've now developed two plans since that. We've developed an implement, implementation plan, which is just a three-year plan to set out some projects and activities make sure that we're just keeping things moving along. And then the second part is a, a plan to reimagining Bendigo Creek, which is a, a major strategy for us to transform our urban waterway. So I suppose these elements that I've just talked about between an MOU, a governance structure, um, you know, resources and plan can sort of help you navigate structures. Um, they're not the be and end all, but they're just some useful strategies to navigate structures without having to try and tear them down. So just something to keep in mind if you're thinking about this stuff. Next slide, please, Tim. Now, <laughs> cultural resilience. Is there a need to change culture within Australia with these three progressives sort of in one way or another dominating the mainstream culture? You know, Australia is you know, got a lot of diversity with it. And, you know, I think that's a really beautiful thing. But um, one challenge we find ourselves at the moment is that, unfortunately, the male pale and stale agenda of some of these tycoons still dominates how we think as a nation. And, you know, when we're thinking about cities and things like that, they can sometimes, their views dominate over some of the more progressive and innovative spaces. So there, I suppose I'm just saying that there's, there is some tensions within our culture at the moment. Um, and I suppose it's a, it's a need to build a, a bit of an army on the good side, not to, hopefully no one's related to these three gentlemen, um, but you know, so that we can f uh, build resilience in a better area. So next slide, please. So to translate what this sort of culture, this bad culture looks like in the workplace, I wanted to draw five common examples that some of you might come across, some of you might not. Um, but I suppose the first and foremost is the traditionalist. This is this chap in the bottom left. Um, and I suppose a, they're a bit closed minded and hell bent on keeping the status quo. And you know, one of their common favorite sayings is, we don't do it that way. And which can be really, it can crush you at times. And it's just, you know, you just got to accept them for who they are and find ways to navigate them. Um, then the second one is the comfort cruiser in the bottom right. Uh, and I suppose they've got comfortable in their position. Sometimes they're in a position of power, sometimes not, but they're usually unwilling to lift a fin finger and they put up hurdles should you ask them to do any work for them. Um, and they'll, you know, they, they'll probably say, oh, I'm snowed under right now, can't help you. But it's, it's a common phrase. So they're just one to watch because you're not going to get much from them. And then in the top right, um, you know, I think there's something that's happened within Australia in probably recent decades is we've become quite a risk adverse culture. And I think we dodge risk. And it's sometimes we might revert to saying no or going deaf by analysis. And, you know, their, their, com their common expression is, oh, I'm sorry, my analysis says XXX, whatever it may be. But it's, it's sort of often done from a limited lens and doesn't consider the benefits, just considers the worst case scenario. Um, then in the, in the middle, I've got Tony Abbott, which, you know, he, you won't find him in many workplaces. If you do, I, I feel for you. Um, but I suppose it's what I wanted to get across with this image is the splitter. He uses division and silos to maintain his tight control of dollars and people. Um, and, I, and there's a real danger in that because it splits the ability to collaborate. Um, and, you know, I suppose in the workplace, one of the common expressions is, oh, we'll need another project to manage that. And it's always just creating another problem, another thing for others to try and join bits together and see how we can find mutual benefits. And then lastly, the top left is the stickler. Obsessed with rules and complying with processes and procedures um, rather than achieving outcomes. You know, essentially they want to push the, just keep on pushing the envelope. 
uh, which you know, and they'll often refer you to a policy or a legislation or a set of rules, which just, you know, sure you've got to be compliant here and there, but you know, if you're trying to make change, they can really get in the way and take all your energy. So, you know, just, I just wanted to raise, you know, be aware of these, you know, because you do need to know your enemy and you don't need to destroy them. You just need to know them and just think about how you can sort of, you know, one, identify them and then how you can navigate them. So next slide. So with all that in mind, I suppose I'm going to share some, some wisdom I heard from a, a peer, Caroline Cavallo, from, who used to be with Knox City Council, now with Alluvium. She made a strong point of you really need to cultivate the right culture to create change. I mean, she used to use it through recruiting. And I think, you know, I was lucky enough to recruit Stallone, Jacinta Ardern, and uh, Maria Mohammed and yeah, Captain Barnacles. So, you know, that was a pretty fortunate scoop. Now, I, I, some of this is a bit fictionalised, but I suppose I wanted to highlight some key personalities that I've got around my circle. And I you know, just wanted to maybe, you know, dramatise it a little bit. But first and foremost, um, you need fresh blood. And I've, the, the, the young lady in the left, I think, represents that. You know, it's, it's always good to have, you know, a bit of diversity, youth, um, enthusiasm, and someone that, I suppose, isn't afraid to ask why, and, and, and it assesses and presents new options, new ways of doing things. They're invaluable, especially for new, you know, when you've got, you know, against, you know, the traditionalist. So they're really important elements to have. Um, two, you need, you need a Sylvester Stallone of some sort. You need someone that's a risk taker. You need someone that's and a doer, someone that can get things done and not afraid to, you know, take a little bit of heat, but just gets it done. Um, and you yeah, know, they can, um, they can get you some wins, but uh, I suppose importantly from this person, they also learn quickly. You know, they, they might make a mistake, but they, they adjust and adapt. So really important to have that. Um, then Captain Barnacles, who I also might call the rudder. He is sometimes a probably more experienced person that knows the system and which direction to go. And they know how to weather the storms and they just keep on that direction, keep moving through it. Um, and then lastly, you, you need a Jacinda Ardern sort of character, it's someone that can bring people together and build new connections and continually strengthen the links. And, you know, and I suppose Jacinda's really got that empathy that brings people together. So I think that's what I'm calling, you know, the gang of four, a new hope. And, you know, sometimes it might be split between eight different people or 20 different people. It doesn't really matter how many people, but some of those attributes can be really good. And I suppose it's, um, you know, I just wanted to highlight um, that, you know, there's a beautiful quote from Margaret Mead that never doubt that a small group of thoughtful and committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, that's the only way things have ever has. They sometimes start small, but use that pe people. And within the Bendigo context, we're currently working through the reimagining Bendigo Creek project, which is, you know, th this project has allowed a whole lot of individuals to come together and work towards a, um, a common vision. And we're all got the same values and we're sort of supporting each other to get there. All right, I've got to hurry up because I've just realised I'm banging on a bit. Um, <laughs> lastly, uh, I, I've got the, the personal. So next slide. It, it, um, I suppose I just encourage all of you um, to continually build your leadership capacity. Um, you know, we're, we're all leaders at the end of the day. You know, leadership's not left for the CEOs. We're all leaders. So if you ever get a chance to do a leadership course or act in leadership, take it. I've done two leadership courses now in the last two years and I think I could do another one soon. Like they're just great things to do when you continually learn some more things about yourself. But then also practice it. You know, 80% of leadership comes through practice. And you know, you'll make mistakes, but it's you know great to build in it. Um, for anyone that is trying integrated water management or water sensitive cities, one thing you've got to keep in mind, protect your energy reserves and constantly recharge. Because you do get smashed and you're always pulling, you know, getting stretched in so many different directions. So just make sure you look after your energy reserves. I've hit a few lows in my journey uh, and it does lead to, you know, poor mental health and, you know, grumpiness and all the rest of it. So just make sure you do it. And then lastly, you know, constantly practice self-care and, and empathy. You know, you know, it's a new world. It's, a, it's getting an increasingly, um, I suppose, volatile, but also uncertain world. So look out for each other and yourself. So I think 
that's all my slides other than, yeah, I'll leave it at that so we've got at least a little bit of time for Q&A. Sorry for chatting so long, but hopefully that was useful. Thanks, Liam. Thanks, uh, thanks very much for taking us a big picture look at uh, resilience through uh, cultural and, and, and structural and personal resilience. All right, um, we, we are running out of time, but um, we, we do have uh, a few minutes and uh, I don't think any of our speakers have to rush off too quickly. So if people have got the, uh, the, uh, the energy to stay online, we can, uh, we can keep the, uh, the Q&A panel going for, uh, uh, maybe we'll give ourselves an extra, an extra five minutes and uh, finish up around, uh, around uh, five past seven. All right, uh, now I need to find some questions here. Okay, so the first question is from David Lee. Uh, David says, thanks Paul and Jetta for fantastic presentations. Are there currently any avenues for buy-in from the community to be involved in infrastructure and IWM projects? So maybe just in the interest of time, Paul, do you want to answer that one? Sure, I, I can have a go at it. And, and it's, um, it's, it's timely in, in some senses. I've been working recently with uh, the Water Services Association of Australia and, uh, and a working group um, of Australian water authorities um, around this very uh, idea. And it's, it's the fact that what, um, you know, that, that what are the, the principles of, of, you know, good or best practice in terms of integrated water management. Um, and one of those, I, I guess, or some of those is um, certainly about the the requirements to be um, seeking to uh, develop processes that um, effectively bring communities in to uh, decision making and, and planning processes. Um, so, um, uh, the, so the question was, what uh, opportunities are there? Well, um, unfortunately, there's there's no one size fits all approach. And, and in the past, um, this uh, is why our um, engagement has often been quite limited. Um, we, um, probably all of us here, um, have a very rich understanding of our urban water cycle and integrated water management. Um, we know it, we live it and breathe it and we love it. Um, and often we have the tendency to um, develop engagement processes um, where we assume that uh, the sorts of knowledge that we have, um, uh, uh, you know, that the communities that we're trying to work with have that knowledge or even that interest. Um, that's uh, this great process that uh, in social science is referred to this idea of institutional minimism. Um, and usually what it ends up in is engaging people that do have the literacies and that do care, which, you know, often you're, you're environmentally conscious greenies and so on. Um, effective engagement needs to be uh, beginning to go a bit further than that, um, you know, that, that common approach. It needs to be thinking about how are we, um, you know, to bringing our, um, our, our interests of sort of integrated urban water management and um, building community engagement in ways that aligns to their interests and supports their needs. So what are the values of things like water sensitive cities, street trees, for example, and urban greening, and what sort of things um, might they support, uh, you know, communities um, or, or what sort of interests might they tap into? Once we start to identify what those sorts of key areas of interest are, we can start to translate some of this complex sort of water systems uh, science in ways where communities go, oh, well, that actually is something that I do care about and want to have a role in. So, so that's what I would say is, is the one kind of common opportunity. Um, it requires us um, not to do once off initial engagement and talk about integrated water management or, or activated swales or things like that, but actually start thinking about um, community connection, parks, green spaces, um, having fun, and some of these kind of basic um, benefits that things like integrated water management support and achieve and, and how we can build those sorts of processes. Can add to that very cool. Tim, or did you want to move on? I might, um, I might just go to another question, Jed, if that's okay. But uh, I'll give you first, uh, first crack at this one, if that's uh, <laughs> if you're happy to happy to answer it. Um, 
Great question from, from Dan O'Halloran. Um, do you think that the existence of infrastructure that limits our direct exposure to events like floods hinders our ability to grow water literacy broadly across the community? Sorry, I'm muted. There we go. I'd say there could be an element of that. Yes, if, if I take the example of um, people turning on the tap to get a glass of water, if they don't have an understanding of where that water comes from, they're unlikely to have an interest in how that piece of infrastructure has relevance to them or, um, yeah, trying to get their buy-in on how we're kind of developing um, strategic responses to ensuring we, we have drought resilience for, say, our dams. So, so yes, but uh, yeah, it's, it's what I guess Paul was touching on with his presentation is you still need, need a balance of both and you can't have one without the other. And it's how we best um, ensure there's the right level of both infrastructure and social resilience um, to, to ensure that yeah, we get the best outcomes. Um, for different areas of the community. But yeah, overall, yes, I think if we're not too careful and we over engineer, um, you're not going to get the right level of social resilience that we're, that we're looking for uh, in renewal areas, um, such as Fisherman's Bend or, or, yeah, or other areas across the state. Yep. Thanks, Jetta. I think um, we might have time for one last question. I've got a question here from Bao. Um, another really good question. Uh, and uh, the question is to unpack a little bit on the key actions to take in order to increase water literacy um, and then increase uh, social resilience in uh, an uncertain future context. Um, <laughs> Who would like to take that one? Maybe um, Andrew, any thoughts or? I guess um, the challenges of creating word literacy, it is about getting people seeing water in their urban environment is, what is an important part, part of it. It is a real hinder if we don't actually see floods we don't see that water and the, the challenges that it is. You know, the Brisbane floods certainly raised it, that literacy uh, significantly. And that, that's this infrastructure balance aspect. You don't actually see it. And that's where the change in urban design will actually start to think about actually how do we make water visible in the environment rather than it just drains away. And certainly the water sensitive urban design movement of creating landscape as part of it, part of the urban environment, which is also a drainage solution, has certainly uh, facilitated more literacy about, about uh, water sensitive design. But yeah, it's the places where we get most literacy is usually in areas where they're, they're prone to flooding. Um, Thanks, I'll Andrew. Add, I'll add some further commentary if that's all right. Go for it, Lou. Yeah, um, I think two things come to mind. Is one, as an as a sector, we're probably a bit too overcomplicated. You know, you can't, how do you make people more educated if we overcomplicate how we communicate with people? I think you know we've got to simplify our communication. You know, it's one thing to say oh, I expect everyone to talk like water engineers and water professionals. I think that will be a lost cause. It's sort of like expecting people to become like a lawyer. It just won't happen. So we do need to get simpler. I think. You know, although the water cycle is complex, I think we do overcomplicate at times. So simplification is definitely one of the strategies you need to use. And then, you know, I suppose we've also got a the second part is probably looking at, you know, it's a bit too convenient at the moment. We've had it too good for too long, so we get complacent. So, you know, perhaps we need to use adversity um, to better affect, um, you know, and you, you do have to capitalise on those moments, you know. Droughts are great for it. Floods are great for it. <laughs> you know, you just capitalise them. But when times are good, people are complacent. So, yeah, that's my two cents. Thanks, Lou. I'd add on to that, Liam. Is, is 
organisations actually need to be willing to understand and take on risk. The default is to infrastructure risk away. And if we really truly want to look at resilience, you're actually taking risk. And mm. organisations need to be actually understanding that. Yeah, spot on. Yep. Yeah. All right. Look, thanks everyone. We're uh, we we are over time, so I might draw it to a close, unfortunately, because I think we could um, continue to talk about water literacy um, for uh, for hours to come, and uh, maybe that is a great topic for another uh, AWA webinar. Um, but uh, look, I'd uh, I'd really like to uh, thank uh, thank everyone for for joining us uh, this evening. Thanks for uh, thanks for listening in. Um, Thanks to, sorry, I've got another slide here, which I need to uh, move through to. Uh, sorry, I'm wrapping up ahead of uh, time, but just uh, just a quick plug for uh, some, some upcoming webinars. We've got the Bushfire Recovery Hackathon, 20th of August, uh, and then a, another webinar, Potable Reuse, just a matter of time um, question, uh, 22nd of September. So check those out on the AWA website. That was a slide I was looking for. Principal, uh, principal members, thanks to our thanks to our principal members for their continued support. Thanks uh, very much to Digna for uh, her work behind the scenes to make this uh, make this webinar a reality. Um, thanks for all the questions uh, and a very uh, big thank you to our super speakers uh, and our panelists, uh, Liam, Jedda, Paul, and Andrew. Thanks very much, and uh, have a great evening, everyone. Thanks everyone. Yeah. Happy to stick around and have a few more goes at some of these questions in the chat thread. If people are hanging out to have their question answered, I'll, I'll have a go at it for you, but also feel free to shoot me an email anytime. And I, and I second that as well. Well said, Paul. And, and the same for me. Mm -hmm. Well, what we could always do is we could have an uh, e cup of ketchup um, uh, one morning if our speakers are available for a half hour session on the morning tea time and then our members can just join us in a little forum format. If there's appetite for that since the speakers are happy and have the time, we can certainly look at that um, and get you all, uh, to get to your families and your dinners and everything. <laughs> Igna wants to wrap us up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm seeing yep. people, I'm looking at the participation. So I think um, uh, I'm more conscious of the, the panelists. Oh, we're just getting warmed up, Digna. <laughs> 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 uh, so there are any questions, you probably need to unmute. Uh, can people unmute Digna and, and ask a question? Uh, no, but I can. We have about 30 people left. Um, I'll just... Um... Either, uh, either uh, put, your, put your hand up and, uh, and, and ask it or, or type, it, uh, type it afresh into the chat. Um, did we cover all the questions? There is a, still a couple in there, but I don't know if they're still there. Um, I know Emily Good asked a question and... I think there was one around your polling uh, as well there, Liam. Yeah, I think I think it's sort of answered, but I, if Emily's still there, happy to... Oh, I'm it. still here. <laughs> ah, good, good. Uh, nah, I, I'm really interested in it because I've been... Uh, so, quick background on me, I'm a PhD student basically studying water resilience and, and how we um, evaluate how effective our water systems are focusing on water sensitive urban design. I'm based in Bendigo. So that's why I was particularly interested in what it was like in Bendigo in Liam's experience. Let's get up for a coffee, Emily. I think that yeah, I think that's okay. that. So yeah, I'll, I'll search you down LinkedIn or something like that or shoot us an email. Yeah. Um, yeah. Cool. Cool.
for coffee and, and perhaps we get Emily up on the panel at some point too. It sounds like she's going to probably answer some of these questions better than we can. Uh, <laughs> oh, I don't mind talking, it's fine. Yeah, I would be up for one day. Um, it was particularly about literacy. Um, so my main job and why I got into academia was I love teaching and particularly educating children into engineering. And all I was thinking when we were thinking water, talking about the water literacy was how much we, how easy it would be to integrate into our, our outreach programs with, for engineering and how we should, might be an idea, if maybe we should be start integrating that and working something out there because it's not something we're really doing at the moment, but definitely a huge opportunity there. Sorry, I'm what do you mean by um, outreach programs? And so um, pretty much every university I know has some sort of outreach program into reaching out for STEM based subjects. Mm -hmm. I know that Latrobe oh. has a large one yeah. um, and that would be a way we could integrate water literacy into our high schools. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, you're, 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 I, I guess I'm coming from a bit of a similar background to you, Emily, in that my, um, while I was doing my PhD, I was also uh, working uh, part-time with Melbourne Water Education, running tours of the Western Treatment Plant and, mm -hmm. um, you know, from time to time also putting on the Vinnie the Platypus costume and getting out there along the waterways <laughs> and giving high fives and things like that. Um, so I understand it full well, and and I do know that um, you know both um, uh, primary and secondary um, education streams do have um, sort of units within them that explore water at different mm. um, different grades and, and, and explore yeah. waters of environment and sustainability. Um, it then becomes up to I guess how the school chooses to interpret that and develop mm. that curriculum. Um, one of the the key challenges I, I've found is um, is has got to do, and it's and, and it links back to things like social equality. Um, it's about who has access to okay. um, you know really good educational resources um, for for a lot of um, you know uh, wealthier schools um, tours to the Western Treatment Plan and you know places like that were a regular thing, but it was often less common that we were seeing some of the um, you know, less uh, or, or schools from less economically wealthy contexts. Mm. I'm engaging. There's more challenges associated to that. So, so that's definitely a, a critical challenge. Um, and I think the other thing is is that what those education programs provide is a really fantastic starting point. Um, you know, to, to be building a, a base level um, sort of understanding of things like the urban water cycle, what these ideas of water sensitive urban design are. Mm. Um, uh, the next step, I guess, is what it looks like, um, you know, at a local scale, what it looks like in your own back door. Absolutely. And, um, and that, um, that is, a, is a fundamentally different process to, to literacy building. I think it's about engaging people in place. Mm. Um, and, and the importance of that is not just in terms of building community understanding, but it's also, um, you know, bringing... Uh, it's also two-way knowledge exchange. It's, it's bringing communities... Um, into a process of infrastructure planning and management and development, which um, essentially allows infrastructure to be more contextually appropriate and more suited to community, um, you know, community values and needs. So it will be supported for a long, over a long-term period. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. It's, yeah, just uh, that local scale is so important because if we talk in a very broad scale, no one cares, but if you can use your local, and I think this is where our local councils need to get involved with it, and um, yeah, just the, the local water authorities as well to really start um, bringing it into a local setting with these students. Mm. Because once we, I mean, this is a long-term thing, of course, because once we've, um, teach our students and we can they become adults one day and voters. So it's, it's yes, yeah, long-term progress. Yeah, and, and, you know, not just that, but we have found um, that some of the um, more powerful drivers of, um, of value change and, and or, or literacy building um, in households are people's kids. Um, you know, there's, there's, and there's a, a multitude of research mm -hmm. that, 
that supports this um, it is, you know, um, for, for, for any of you out there that do have kids, you know, you can probably relate. They go off to primary and high school and they come back with, you know, interesting things that, um, you know, they pass on to their parents um, and, and shape and influence their parents' values and behaviours in the process. Mm. Yes. All right. All right. Thanks, Paul. Look, um, there are still a few questions coming in, but uh, I suspect uh, if we don't uh, draw things to a close, we uh, we may never get out of here. Um, with uh, uh, yeah, just the just the uh, the interest in the topic. So I think there's uh, with those last few questions, we might just um, provide some answers offline to those, and uh, we'll uh, we'll draw things to a close for tonight. But uh, thanks, uh, thanks to everyone for, for sticking around, and thanks to thanks uh, to Paul and, and uh, Liam uh, uh, as well for uh, sticking around to answer those questions for us.